got a, a fully working project, which definitely makes me think that augmented reality is closer to actually existing in some form than I thought it was. Um, so with that, you'll hear about it yourself. So, as Professor Samuel mentioned, I'm Christopher Mitchell, and I'm going to be discussing applications of algorithm methods to facial detection and recognition in augmented reality and computing. So, I'm going to go through a bunch of different areas. I'm going to first talk about some of the uh, different concepts that go into my project and try to break down my title a little bit for you, which is really helpful. I'm going to discuss some of the previous work I examined. Uh, in facial detection, recognition, and wearable computing in augmented reality. I'll talk about the experimentation I did, uh, how I developed the software and hardware of the project. I'll then go into the final implementation as it now stands, which you can see here. Uh, I'll discuss the results of the project, how it turned out, how it compared to my expectations, and how it performed uh, algorithmically and uh, speed-wise. And finally, I'll conclude with a brief overview and I'll look at some of the future work that I might consider. So my title, as I said, is fairly unwieldy. So I'll break it down for you. <coughs> okay, the application is complicated neural networks. So unlike traditional neural networks, which connect neurons in multiple layers to extract some useful information about input data, convolutional neural networks process 2D images or uh, matrices as the elements of the network. You can see here, a standard Lynette 5 network that I'll discuss later. Facial detection is the task of examining a large input image uh, from the real world as a real-time image or a pre-taken photograph, finding all the faces in it and approximately determining the scale and possibly the rotation and other attributes of each face. Facial recognition is a similar task and involves taking a face that has already been found and matching it either to one set of known individuals or determining that it's one of an, uh, an unknown individual. Augmented reality is a field that's been in technology news a lot lately. It refers to taking <coughs> visual data and overlaying it on a reproduction of the real world. In this case, taking uh, facial detection and recognition and overlaying them on real-time webcam feeds. Finally, wearable computing uh, talks about platforms that can be used to perform computing anywhere. Another term is ubiquitous computing. Wearable computers generally have different requirements than traditional computers in that they need to be as mobile as possible, have high processing power and long battery life, and use non-standard input and output devices. So in order to figure out, uh, sorry, uh, several applications that I've considered for my project uh, include law enforcement. For example, if officers were wearing such a system, they could identify suspects or wanted individuals more efficiently and more accurately than if they simply memorized the faces of important individuals. Uh, EMTs and doctors could wear such a system to identify patients, uh, get information about their medical history, medications they were taking, even if the individual was unconscious or didn't have identification. And finally, it could be useful for individuals with visual or memory impairment, such as uh, blind people, those with Alzheimer's, to identify important individuals around them if they were unable to do so themselves. I had to look at a lot of previous research in order to determine uh, the correct method to go about uh, recognizing faces, detecting faces, and performing augmented reality as it applies to wearable computing systems. I started my examination with facial recognition algorithms. It's historically been one of the most widely researched fields in image processing, and it started in the 1970s and early 80s with some of the sim most simplistic methods based on the distances between features. So individuals were differentiated, for example, by the ratio of distances between the nose and the mouth, the mouth and each eye. But needless to say, these methods are quite variant to code. For example, if your head is rotated, then some of the ratios change while others do not. And also require some efficient form of uh, feature detection in order to accurately determine the distances. The next family of methods that was attempted involved principal component analysis, or PCA, a general mathematical technique to remove extraneous information from correlated sets of variables, leaving only the independent information. Eigenfaces uh, takes a set of known images that are faces, combines them to extract an eigenface basis, and then can use linear combinations of these faces to represent any other face, either known or unknown. The first 
application of uh, PCA, which appreciated eigenfaces, was able to represent accurately a face within a 3% uh, reconstruction error using 2 to the 9th to 2 to the 10th less bits than are required for the raw 128 by 128 pixel image. <coughs> eigenfaces was the next logical extension of PCA. And as I said, it involves taking a set of images and extracting an eigenface basis. If uh, eigenface training is performed by taking a set of known faces, uh, either who do not necessarily need to be known individuals, extracting the eigenface basis, and then constructing a database of known individuals uh, identified by the vectors uh, corresponding to the coefficients of a linear combination of faces. So for example, if you extract an eigenface basis of three eigenfaces, a particular individual might be identified as two times the first face plus 1.2 times the second eigenface minus 3.4 times the third eigenface. And the sum of those pixel intensities <coughs> would make an accurate, accurate picture of the individual. It's conceptually simple, but because it deals with linear combinations of pixel intensities, it's necessarily very susceptible to ch changes in lighting and background, and also does not work well under translation, scaling, and uh, lighting variation. The next uh, algorithm that attempted to mitigate some of the problems with eigenfaces is called fissure faces. And it operates on the assumption that if you took the same individual and photographed them under a variety of head codes, variations, lighting, changes, occlusions, etc., you get a wider variation in images than if you took a number of different human faces photographed under the exact same pose, scale, and lighting conditions. Like eigenfaces, Fisher faces has a training and a testing phase, and I'll discuss that now. So in order to train a Fisher face database, first you take a set of known individuals, you need at least two images of each individual, and you try to minimize the scatter within the class by bringing the uh, principal component analysis process vectors for each face closer to faces in the same class in some high dimensional space while separating clusters of known individuals from each other. Testing is performed similarly to eigenfaces, and uh, in tests to determine performance, it was found that Fisher faces are successful in recognizing faces with only a 4.6% recognition error when a lighting source has up to a 45 degree angle to the uh, vector normal to a face, in other words, directly out of the person's face plane. Uh, eigenfaces perform much uh, far, far inferiorly, uh, achieving only a uh, sorry, 58% recognition rate or 41.5% recognition error. There have been many, many other methods that have been applied. Uh, for example, hidden markup models, which are generally used for 1D problems such as speech recognition, have been applied. Uh, commonly shown neural networks, which although they are poorly uh, suited to tests of distinguishing classes of the same object. They are very good at distinguishing different classes of objects and have been applied as uh, components within larger space recognition systems. And support vector machines, which have been applied to a range of computational problems, including many image processing applications. Facial detection is a related uh, subject to facial recognition, and some of the same methods have been applied to detection and have been applied to recognition. The ideal detection algorithm, as you might uh, understand, is invariant to as many different changes in faces as possible. So it should be able to detect faces with different scales, uh, different lighting, uh, gradients of lighting across the face, uh, different rotations such as yaw, which is uh, side to side rotation, pitch, or up and down rotation, and roll, which is in plane rotation. Uh, lighting, occlusion, such as ob either objects in the way of the face, or facial accessories such as eyeglasses, hats, beards, etc. <coughs> Translation, so that uh, the same face should be detected anywhere in an image, regardless of where it is. So there's two main classes of detectors. There's ones that examine an image to look for an entire image of a face, for example, as I mentioned, PCA and uh, Fisher faces. Many neural networks have also been trained to perform full face detection, and there are several stochastic uh, or probabilistic approaches that have been attempted. There's also feature detection based methods that either look for high level features, such as eyes, noses, and mouths, and use these to determine the location of faces, or look for lower level features, such as 
specific skin tone, colors, uh, edges that may determine, uh, that may match the shape of the face and other similar things. <coughs> and finally, there's active shape models that attempt to build a real-time 2D or 3D face model and track a face uh, with the model. <laughs> Eigen faces, as I mentioned, can be applied to recognition, but can equally be applied to detection. Whereas for recognition, a face is transformed from in space to an eigenface face and represented as a vector of uh, linear combinations of eigenfaces. In order to perform detection, the vector in uh, face space must be converted back to image space. The way that eigenfaces works, if you take, for example, a chair, convert it to eigenspace and then back to face space, you'll get, uh, sorry, back to image space, you'll get a face. But necessarily, the mean square between a chair and a face is larger than a mean square error between a face and another face, even if the reconstruction of the face doesn't in the way. So uh, the a threshold can be applied to the mean squared error between any sub-image and uh, to determine whether it is indeed a face or not. Eigen's features operate on a similar principle. Instead of constructing a basis of faces, you construct a basis of features, for example, a set of eigen eyes, eigen mouth, et cetera. And then you can either scan through an image in parallel searching for several features and correlate their respective locations, or you can scan through for one set of features, for example, only look for left eyes. And once you found what may be a left eye, search around it for a right eye and a mouth. Uh, these have uh, varying degrees of accuracy and efficiency, generally in the latter method is preferred. The heart classifier is based on features as well, but it's based on low-level features. For example, uh, dark edges, uh, lighter areas uh, surrounded by a dark background, etc. They operate on contrast instead of brightness, so anything based on a heart cascade is uh, more robust against lighting changes than something based on absolute pixel intensity. A cascade is defined as uh, something that successively examines areas of the image under more and more detail. So a hard cascade in defining, say, a face as one of, as a combination of several different hard features can search for a very small subset of these features through an image, discard areas that couldn't possibly contain a face as containing none of this small subset, and then grow the subset to be larger and larger until it reaches the size of the full face feature detection set, uh, and successfully, successively eliminate uh, parts of the input image to do the project. You can see here a simplified view of some possible features. For example, uh, a lighter uh, line on a dark background, a dark line end on a light background, uh, a darker area next to a lighter area, and as I said, it's based on contrast. So if you had uh, light gray next to white, that would be equally detected as dark gray next to light gray. Uh, the heart classifier has been applied to facial detection in several published works. The best performance achieved currently is around 95% accuracy in detecting faces and uh, avoiding false positives at 5 frames per second, which is among the fastest that face detection elements have performed and is uh, sufficient for real-time detection. Horror cascades are able to take advantage of additional efficiency methods besides uh, the cascade implementation including something called an integral image. Because our cascades are based on image contrast, uh, constructing something called an integral image in which each pixel is the sum of all the pixels in the original image to the left and above that pixel, uh, a simple sum of six to eight values can be used to determine the total uh, pixel sum in any area of the image. Multilayer perceptrons, or neural networks, have been applied to spatial detection. Among the published implementations that I looked at, one uh, went very slowly, achieving uh, one frame detection in 283 seconds and uh, only getting around 77 to 90% 90, 90 accuracy, depending on the false positive rate allowed. Another implementation operated much faster, around one frame per second, uh, operated within the same accuracy bounds and worked by examining an input image using five parallel neural networks in order to correlate their results and determine what areas contain the space. You can see the structure of the canonical neural network here. It has an input layer with uh, several neurons, one or more hidden layers, and an output layer. This is a fully connected neural network in that each neuron in each layer is connected to all the neurons in the next layer. But it's also possible and indeed popular to 
have non-fully connected networks and networks in which neurons are connected to layers other than the ones immediately uh, preceding or succeeding them. So, for example, this neuron might be connected to this one and this one. Multilayer perceptrons are trained by something called gradient backpropagation, which is significant because it's also used for convolutional neural networks. Gradient backpropagation is a method of taking a training set, for example, of face images, which have uh, uh, face images and non-face images, each of which has been assigned an output vector, for example, one indicating face and zero indicating not face. As each training image is passed through an untrained neural network, some weights, some uh, values will be returned to the output of the neural network, which may or may not correspond to the correct uh, values that are expected. The difference between the expected results and the experimental results can be backpropagated through the network to update the weights and biases that are associated with each neuron connection that I showed you. And uh, to avoid overfitting or underfitting to a training set, a coefficient called uh, the learning rate or mu uh, makes it that only a fraction of the error that's calculated is propagated backwards. Convolutional neural networks have been uh, one of the most recent <coughs> methods that have been applied to facial detection. They were first used for things such as digit recognition and object uh, distinction, for example, to determine the difference between a, a picture of a model plane and a model truck. Uh, there's three types of CNN layers, which a CNN is constructed similarly to a multi-layer perceptron, in which there's an input layer, one or more intermediate layers, and an output layer. But the three types of CNN layers are convolutional layers, which take each uh, sub-area of an input image, convolve it with a pre-calculated kernel, add a bias, and use that as one of the elements of the output. There's subsampling layers, which, as expected, subsample uh, an image by taking the average of some area, for example, this has a step size of 2 and x and 2 and y, and then adding bias to create each output. And full connection layers, which are structurally identical to the connection between a hidden layer and uh, the output layer in a fully connected uh, multi-layer perceptron. Each layer can connect one or more inputs, uh, connect one or more input to one or more outputs, as in a standard neural network. And the only difference is that each neuron, so to speak, is a 2 d array rather than a single scale. <coughs> One of the earliest application attempts for CNNs to facial detection was uh, created in 1991. It contains two convolutional layers, one subsampling layer and one full connection layer. The input is a 20 by 20 pixel image which may or may not contain a face, and the output is a single scalar where values close to 1 indicate the presence of a face, and values around negative 1 indicate the absence of a face. Uh, although it achieved 4% correct classification, in other words, out of every 100 uh, images, 96 were correctly classified either as face or not a face, and only 4 were incorrectly classified, because of the distribution of the false positives randomly throughout the image, it was impossible to, to correctly and efficiently localize faces in an image. So, uh, early in the 2000s, the Lynette 5 CNN was applied to the task of face detection. As I mentioned, it was used previously for digit recognition. It takes a 30, 32 by 32 pixel input image, uh, convolves it into six 28 by 28 pixel outputs, uh, then subsamples once to produce uh, six task size uh, matrices, then performs something called a permutational convolution in which each of these 16 10 by 10 pixel images is created through a convolution of between one and six of these layers. Uh, this nonlinearity provides a lot of robust, a lot of the robustness that's inherent to CNN. Uh, it's subsampled again. Uh, convolution is performed to create a 120 element vector, and full connection <coughs> is then performed. This example I show has uh, six output neurons, but uh, CNNs, uh, Linux 5 networks rather, can have anywhere from one to uh, as many as I believe 40 outputs in published documentation. It has about 60,000 weights to be trained, and these are shared between 340,000 total connections in the network. 
The performance of the Linet 5 network as applied to facial detection has, uh, is excellent. Uh, the application that I looked at used it as a simultaneous face detector and pose estimator. So it had uh, nine scalar outputs, each of which represented a parameterized pose estimate for the face in question, or indicate a point far from a face manifold in a nine-dimensional space, in other words, a non-face. So tested on a set of uh, images, it was found to produce a 90% accuracy uh, rate of detection with a 4.42 uh, positive detect, uh, false positive per image rate, or if a rate of uh, an average of 26.9 false positives per image were allowed, then it was able to achieve a 97% uh, accuracy rate. Uh, one particular fact about convolutional neural networks is because they take a large number of floating point operations to get from the input of the network all the way to the output, uh, small values can grow exponentially through the network. So the output of every layer is passed through a 10 sigmoid, which uh, saturates <coughs> any value larger than 1.719 or smaller than negative 1.719 to those bounds. Wearable computing and augmented reality have been explored extensively. Uh, the ideal wearable computer, as extracted from my research, is lightweight, uh, low power, and therefore has a long battery life, and has as much computational power as possible. Augmented reality is one of the most frequent uses for uh, wearable computing systems and refers to any system that takes digital data and overlays it onto a reproduction of the real world. Indeed, augmented reality falls on a scale called Milgram Continuum, which runs the gamut from reality, just looking at people and interpreting things with your brain, and virtuality, in which the user is fully immersed in a fabricated virtual world. There are shades in between. Uh, I'm looking at augmented reality, which is overlaying digital data on a reproduction of the real world. And there's also augmented virtuality, which instead augments data from the real world over a virtual world. Augmented reality can be further subdivided into two categories, uh, data that's unrelated to the particular context the user's in. For example, uh, if somebody was notified of text messages that they got or emails as they walked around in a heads-up display, or context-sensitive information, for example, <coughs> my project, which interprets the scene being viewed and provides helpful data based on that. Uh, hardware used for wearable computing has ranged widely, anywhere from uh, PDAs that contain uh, processing power, a display, and a camera for input, uh, to servers or desktops that can be used with fixed augmented reality systems that are meant to be used in a particular location, to a system containing a commodity laptop and power supply in a backpack for augmented reality projects that wish to be tested in algorithm but haven't yet developed a fast and low power wearable hardware system. Uh, one particular approach used to both limit the weight and power usage of the wearable computing system without limiting its processing power is sharing some of the load of processing to a remote server that has basically uh, unlimited power available to it and uh, much wider margins in terms of weight and heat. Input and output necessarily is much different than traditional input and output devices. Uh, you couldn't use a keyboard or mouse or LCD or series key monitor. So it's necessary to use uh, unique output devices. For example, the heads up display that you can see here. Um, there have been several projects recently that use Pico projectors to project onto your wrist or surfaces in front of you. Uh, you can use uh, audio output, so a system that can operate entirely through uh, voice synthesis. And input devices are similarly varied, including most widely cameras for augmented reality, uh, voice commands recognized by a microphone, gaze tracking with cameras, and uh, handheld glove-mounted or arm-mounted keyboards that can be used. Some of the applications that I looked at of wearable computing systems included a context-aware system that used audio-only input and output to provide directions and contextual information, uh, a more popular video acquisition system that would record things that you were writing or typing and save them along with context for later use, uh, a PDA-based navigation system that allowed the user to scan 2D barcodes and overlay a 
three-dimensional floor plan of an office uh, in that direction, and a system that augmented a real-time view with 3D objects that didn't actually exist. It would register flat surfaces and overlay images, uh, objects onto that surface. So my experimentation carried me through developing the algorithms I felt were most well suited to a wearable computing system. I first implemented a convolutional neural network face detector. I also had to train uh, a training set to uh, accurately detect faces, which was the most time-consuming part of the project. I developed a novel overlap removal algorithm. I implemented the hard cascade for feature detection. I wrote a normalizer that normalizes each face based on the feature detection and passes it to a facial recognition module to attempt to recognize individual seen in a frame. So I started with the CNN uh, detector. I started with a reference implementation and was able to achieve a 30 minute per frame uh, processing time for 32 by 32 pixel frames, which obviously is far out of the range of real time detection. But uh, by catching weights and eliminating a huge chunk of uh, file processing routines, I was able to achieve a rate of around 22 frames per second. Uh, I experimented with expanding the input frame size, uh, found it to be quite slow, performed additional optimizations, and then implemented a multi-scale detector, which uh, takes each input frame, scales it to a variety of different scales, and then runs the face detector over each scale in order to find the face of any scale in the input. Mm -hmm. I started with uh, scaling the factors of four, so taking a 640 by 40 image, scaling by uh, four the area to create a 320 by 240 image, et cetera. Uh, using three scales starting at 640 by 480, I was able to achieve 12.5 seconds per frame. Uh, implementing a system with six scales, each with uh, dimensions one over the square root of two of the previous uh, scale, but with fewer total pixels being processed, I achieved 11.66 seconds per frame. Much better than 30 seconds per frame, uh, 30 minutes per frame, but still not within the realm of real-time processing. In order to optimize the system further, I contacted one of the founders, the originators of the Lynette uh, Convolutional Neural Network Design, who's at NYU. He suggested I use a library called in the Intel Performance Primitives which contains a large set of math, decoding, and compression routines written in hand-optimized x86 assembly language. Uh, by using those, I was able to increase speed by uh, close to an order of magnitude to 1.9 seconds per frame. With a variety of algorithmic corrections that I discovered, I performed my first successful two-category detection, identifying areas of the image as either faces or non-faces with no overlap removal performed. And you can see that in this image here. Uh, the system has successfully found several of the faces. Uh, it's missed quite a few of them, and there is a large number of overlap and fault detections. Uh, the color corresponds to the confidence of the detection. The least confident detections are in red, the most confident in green, and the color is scaled in between red and green based on the confidence intensity. The classification algorithms that I uh, examined in order to choose the final classification algorithm, uh, each performed uh, increasingly well uh, through this list. The first algorithm I used was the one shown in the previous image, a simple two-class uh, thresholding algorithm that uh, examines the output of the neural network at each uh, location within the image and classified as the face if the confidence exceeded a certain threshold. I then tried two separate versions of this and expanded to six-class detection. Uh, this was my final implementation with, with six classes. Uh, the six classes are, first, a non-face class, if an object in a subimage is in this class, it's not a face, and an additional five face classes, corresponding to uh, pose estimations of uh, roll from negative 25 to negative 15 degrees, negative 15 to negative five, negative five to five, uh, five to 15, and then 15 to 25 degrees. I then tried a Euclidean radial basis function, which performed better than the simple thresholding algorithms. And in the end, I chose a logarithmic classification algorithm that was previously published in uh, CNN research and uh, performed excellently with my network. The final adjustments made to the C3 layer in order to make the order of permutations performed in my training program match that in my testing program 
uh, I achieved some excellent performance. I was able to classify 99.7% of images in the testing set as uh, true negatives and 83% as true positives. This low true positive rate turned out to be due uh, almost entirely to uh, pose estimation errors. For example, something in the range uh, negative 15 to negative 5 degrees being incorrectly classified as being uh, negative 5 to 5 degrees. If I allow the looser interpretation where errors of up to uh, 20 degrees in the worst case scenario or one class uh, higher or lower, then I was able to achieve a 98% true positive. And you can see summarized in these two graphs. This is a strict classification. Uh, you can see that, for example, 11.6% of class four images, which is a uh, roll from five to 15 degrees, are improperly classified as class three, in other words, uh, negative five to five degrees. If I allow uh, classification errors up to one class, then you can see that most of the true positive detection rates are around 98%, uh, and the missed detection rates are all around uh, 1.5 to 2%. Uh, the top row has the false positive rates, which are all uh, around 0.03, 0.07%. CNN training, as I said, was the most time-consuming part of the project. I first had to choose a set of fake databases from existing research. I then constructed a program to perform fake pre-processing in order to normalize all the faces in the training sets. We default my algorithm into 32 by 32 pixel images and perform a variety of applications on the images to artificially expand the size of my training set. I then did perform the actual training and went through an iterative process where I tuned the parameters of the neural network training to produce the highest quality training set for my algorithm. In the end, I chose the uh, three databases, Yale B, which contains relatively few subjects, but under uh, a wide variety of lighting and pose variations, the AT&T or ORL database, which has been used for many projects and contains 40 images, uh, 40 subjects rather, each under 10 variations in uh, pose, scale, and facial accessories and the BioID database, one of the newest space databases that contains uh, faces against a large noisy background, containing about uh, one, uh, 1,300 faces. In order to pre-process each uh, input image from the space databases, I created 10 copies of each, five uh, identical to the input and five flipped around a vertical axis. For all 10 of these copies, I performed a set of five mutations. First, I set the roll of each face to anywhere between negative 45 and 45 degrees. Uh, later in my training, I changed it to negative 25 to 25 degrees to match the five expected alpha classes. Uh, then I scaled each image so the distance between the eyes was 10 to 12 pixels. I then performed additional scaling uh, between 1 and 1.414 times uh, because the network scans over each input image at scales of uh, square root of 2 decreasing, so this ensured that uh, no face would be missed regardless of scale. I performed uh, contrast changes either to reduce the contrast or increase the contrast. And finally, I changed the brightness anywhere from negative 20 to 20 on a 255 scale. You can see some examples here of uh, correctly pre-processed faces. Uh, it was necessary to add annotations of feature locations on a few of the images uh, but for the most part, they came with pre-annotated uh, databases that I was able to process with some Python. I also have created a set of negative samples equal in size to the set of positive samples containing examples uh, as wide as wide a variety of po as possible of negative samples of non-faces. So you can see one of the faces from the Yale B database. Uh, these are the five non mirrored examples. You can see change in scale, the one's larger than that one, uh, reduced brightness, um, increased contrast, etc. And these are five examples of non phases randomly chosen. Uh, there's some landscapes here, something geometric, and an eye, which, although it's part of a face, isn't centered on a face, so is therefore a false uh, uh, negative sample. The earliest performance metrics I got from training against only the LB database. Uh, I was able to achieve a 0.32% classification error as tested against its own training database. 
or against the testing database it hadn't seen previously, 1.72% uh, error. Uh, this was after the network had been trained over 100 epochs. Uh, with the addition of the at and database, training error rose to 1.3% and testing error fell to 1.7% uh, as it was able to, uh, it was more robust against a variety of changes because of the larger variation in training issues. And with the addition of the third database, uh, training error fell once again and training testing error rose only slightly to 1.8% after uh, an order of magnitude fewer epochs than in the first training scenario. In order to uh, create an optimal weight set to test my convolutional neural network, I had to perform parameter tuning. The largest factors in how well the convolutional neural network weights converge to match the training set are the number of epochs that are performed, in other words, how many times the trained network sees each training image, uh, which is variable i, and the learning rate, mu. For a lower mu, the neural network converges more slowly, but tends to not overfit. Whereas for a larger uh, value, it, it may converge more quickly, but there is the possibility it may overfit to the uh, training set. And detected performance before and after tuning can be seen here. So in the top image, which contains a variety of individuals uh, with varying face uh, role, pitch yaw, uh, skin tone, there's a noisy background, um, there's some bias lighting to the right side of the indi individual's faces. You can see that four faces were found out of the eight, and one of those was a weak detection. Whereas after parameter tuning, all eight faces were correctly found with uh, four false positives in the image, and all were found at a high confidence rate. Uh, you can ignore the feature detections that are annotated in uh, purple, cyan, and yellow. Those were from the Eigen feature registration algorithm I tested that I ended up not using. In order to make the output of the computational neural network more coherent, I had to remove overlapping detections. As you saw from the first image of the convolutional neural network in action, there are many overlapping detections. And under the assumption that in real world situations, I wouldn't be interested in identifying or finding faces that were occluded by other faces, I performed overlap removal. So I designed three different uh, iterations as I designed the final algorithm. The first performed simple survival of the fit in which for every pair of overlapping detections in an input image, it removed the weaker of the pair until no overlap remained. Second, I optimized uh, the slightly and debugged it, which uh, created a little bit higher performance. And finally, I added multi-scale voting as a step before simple survival of the fit, where uh, faces that are likely to, detections rather, that are likely to refer to the same face are combined to raise the confidence of uh, correctly detected faces and reduce the confidence of incorrectly uh, detected areas. So first I'll show you the survival of the fittest algorithm. For example, here you have a set of three detections, one very weak, one moderate, and one very confident. If you perform simple survival of the fittest between one and two, because one is the stronger of two, it's retained. And then between one and three, three is the strongest, so only three is retained, uh, retained leading to the situation you have in B. Necessarily, this is incorrect because once one is removed, then two shouldn't have been removed in the first place. So I improved the algorithm to examine all possible overlap scenarios before any removal was actually done, <coughs> which produced the kind of detection that you can see in C, which uh, created a bit higher uh, correct detection rate and lower, uh, lower misdetection rate than with the first implementation. However, I was able to greatly improve the performance without any additional computational neural network training through the use of a multi-scale voting algorithm. It's an extra stage before the survival of the fittest that takes multiple detections, for example, offset by a few pixels but overlapping, uh, offset by uh, one scale, smaller or larger, that have similar role estimates from CNN and are therefore likely to refer to the same face directly behind those detections. It combines them and raises the confidence based on the confidence of each uh, combined detection. And you can see here that it's very successful. Uh, in this sample image, this is the raw set of detections from the convolutional neural network. Uh, there's a huge variety of pose uh, estimates between the different detections, and there's really nothing coherent about this. 
This is after multi-scale voting uh, was performed. You can see that a lot of the detections around the faces have been removed, but there's still some overlap remaining. Uh, and then this is after the survival of the fittest was applied to this multi-scale voting process uh, set detection. All three faces are correctly found, and there's uh, three false positives down the bottom of the image. For comparison, here is the image with only survival of the fittest performed, with no multi-scale voting. You can see that uh, one of the detections is more poorly aligned than it was with both stages. One face is missed entirely, and there's a large clutter of false positives at the bottom of the image. Uh, I implemented this based on a one of the publications I read that mentioned they didn't perform multi-scale voting, but felt that their algorithm could have performed much better had it been applied. In order to uh, recognize where each feature is in a detected face in order to perform recognition, I needed to perform feature registration. So I first tried with eigenfeatures, as I said, a conceptually simple method, which uh, doesn't need much processing power. I extracted uh, feature sets based on my training sets. And for example, this is for a left eye. You can see there's five sets. Each row is uh, one set of left eye corresponding to the five different role classes for my convolutional neural network. It was successful in finding eyes. For example, here are left and right eyes correctly detected in a set of images. But it was very poor at finding mouth. Uh, and despite a lot of debugging effort, I was unable to correct that. You can see here, it found most of the eyes with a uh, high degree of accuracy missed one set, but all the mouths are incorrectly classified. So I moved to a hard cascading registration detector, or registrator rather, uh, based on OpenCV's built in hard registration module. I use the MCS feature set which unlike other sets of left eyes, right eyes, and mouths used for hard uh, feature detection, is uh, much more invariant to things like eyeglasses, uh, facial hair, etc. Because even a hard cascade like a convolutional neural network can detect multiple instances of the same object in an image, I had to prune uh, multiple detections in order to retain at most uh, one possible left eye, right eye, or mouth in each face. Uh, I used a set of cost functions to determine which of the detected features was closest to the expected location of the left eye, right eye, and mouth based on the bounding box generated by the convolutional neural network. I then passed these feature detections to a face normalizer, which attempted to uh, roll and scale each face to approximately match this template. Uh, it contains a face in a 180 by 180 pixel image with uh, features uh, as closely as possible matched to these three locations. Uh, and it's necessary in order to facilitate as accurate facial recognition as possible. Uh, you can see here a sample of six uh, faces that were collected during uh, real-time use of the system. I was walking around Hoover running the algorithm and collecting normalized faces. Uh, these faces uh, came from a variety of original uh, yaw pitch and roll values. For example, you can see roll hip has a, uh, a lot of yaw. Um, there's some occlusion. Uh, there's definitely di differences in, uh, for example, this image has strong lighting from the left. And uh, while it's accurate when there's correct feature detection, if the features have been uh, incorrectly uh, registered within the image, then improper rolling and scale correction is performed. So uh, the normalization image is not correct and therefore recognition fails. And that's because uh, rolling and scaling requires at least two points. Uh, if only one or zero features in a face have been found, then no normalization is performed and therefore no recognition is attempted. The final stage therefore was taking each normalized image and passing it to a fissure face recognizer. I wrote a C implementation based on published research containing two uh, segments. First, something that would take a set of uh, known images, construct a fish face database, and then a second set that would compare this database to a set of normalized faces on each uh, image processing iteration and determine the identity of each normalized face. Uh, as I mentioned, it works on 180 by 180 pixel normalized faces, and in the future, uh, I'd like to make it able to add individuals to the training set on the fly, since I did write a relatively high-speed 
uh, training routine that can be called from within the program itself. Uh, this would allow the system to differentiate between individuals even before the user got a chance to either add their name or decide that they were not desired to be recognized by the system. Uh, here's two examples of recognition performed by the system during operation. Uh, this is when I gave it a static and it said that detection and recognition. Uh, you can see, actually you can't see that well, but it found my mouth and uh, right eye and was able to correctly estimate the center of the face from those. It didn't find the left eye though. Uh, in this image, which was a real-time webcam image, it found all three features. Uh, much more accurately, it found the center of the face and performed accurate uh, recognition. That's a name I stated above each face in case you can't see the back. So with all this experimentation done, my third implementation. The hardware design of the project uses an EEPC 901 as the computing platform. It has a 1.6 gigahertz atom processor, uh, which is uh, hard drive space between two solid state drives, which are necessary for robustness against things like uh, vibration and dropping it by a thing. Uh, Bluetooth and Wi Fi connectivity. A three to four hour battery life when it's running the scalar hardware, a uh, software package that I wrote um, and continuously. It weighs about 2.43 pounds with the battery, and as I said, it has four foot in front of the You can see two images of the computer here. This is the, this is open, the screen and keyboard, this is the underside, uh, the battery sticks out a bit, but other than that it's pretty thin, and you can also see a GPS module that I'm on around here. Uh, input and output is performed respectively by a webcam and a heads-up display. The heads-up display is a Musix VR920 uh, heads-up display, you can see it's standing around here. It contains two 640 by 480 pixel LCDs and can ideally generate 3D video, although the uh, graphics processor in the EEPC doesn't support uh, quad buffering, which is necessary for that. Um, it also has a gyroscope to estimate uh, head pose, which I didn't use in this project, uh, microphone and earphones for audio input and output, and uh, it takes VGA input and uses USB for power, so no external battery pack or power supply is necessary. Uh, input is from a Logitech QuickCam 9000, thanks to Espocom, which uh, I disassembled and made a custom little map for on the front of the heads-up display. This is an example of me wearing the system. This is the heads-up display with the camera, uh, the wires running down behind me to the EPC, which is mounted in a custom zone holster on my belt. So the software suite is informally termed Scouter after a popular Japanese TV show. <laughs> uh, there's two components. There's a display tray that takes input from the camera, stores the frame, uh, augments the latest detection from the processing thread and displays the frames on the display. And there's a processing thread that performs the full set of uh, image processing techniques that I discussed, including uh, facial detection and recognition. The display thread captures video and displays it at a fixed rate, uh, a maximum of six frames per second, which was experimentally determined as a good compromise between uh, display update latency and uh, face recognition speed, necessarily as you increase the desired uh, <coughs> augmented reality uh, frame update speed, less processing power is available to the face recognizer, so there's a higher uh, latency between seeing a face and having it be detected and recognized. Uh, as I said, it's also responsible for overlaying the latest available uh, face detection and recognition video, uh, data onto the frame and pushing each frame out to the heads up display. The processing thread uh, performs face detection using the Linux uh, convolutional neural network, operating on uh, taking video at 640 by 480 pixels and examining six scales between uh, 220 by 240 to 57 by 42 to find faces at a variety of sizes. Uh, it then performs multi-scale voting and overlap removal. It uh, registers features using the heart cascade, performs face normalization, and passes correctly normalized faces to a picture face recognizer. I also examined a bunch of secondary software modules. I tried implementing a GPS daemon that communicates with the GPS and saves uh, to GPS location data when available. It also updates 
that location and get it to a server for future use. Uh, one possible application I considered was it could be uh, determined which faces were most likely to be seen in which geographical areas to uh, improve the accuracy of the face recognizer. I also looked at a wireless connectivity module that would seamlessly hop between access points without the need for pre-configuration as would be necessary in a controlled environment with a wearable computing system for maximal connectivity. And the platform is uh, could be used for a bunch of different uh, wearable computing augmented reality applications containing, as I said, a full uh, input, output, and processing uh, cascade. So results and evaluation of the performance. Uh, I plan to implement a full system, as Professor Sale mentioned, and I succeeded in that as well. I created a full hardware platform capable of computation input and output, and I created the full uh, scouter software uh, face recognition and detection suite, which uh, can detect faces at uh, near real time and uh, show an augmented reality feed at uh, as close as possible to real time. As far as speed goes, as I said, I need to balance the display frames per second versus uh, how fast faces are detected and recognized in each frame. I tried a bunch of different values. You can see, for example, if it only updates the display two times per second, then it can uh, recognize individuals at around uh, 2.5 seconds per iteration. But if you require 10 frames per second from the display, which it manages, it requires between uh, 5 and 7 seconds to process each input image for face detection and recognition purposes. With uh, the 6 frames per second I decided on, I can process uh, a full iteration of the face processing thread in 2.75 seconds when the output window is windowed. And when I maximize it, there is necessarily more bandwidth used between the display and the CPU. So it takes 3.25 seconds per frame. This is a breakdown of where the CPU time is being used throughout the system. Uh, setup takes only 1.8%. The largest part of phase processing is in the CNN, 95% of the time. Uh, and within that, 70% of the total time of the full network, uh, of the full cascade rather, is taken up in the C5 layer. So my future optimization work would center around speeding up that particular aspect. Uh, overlap removal takes a very small percentage of the time as does uh, hard feature registration and uh, both normalization and face recognition. Face detection performance was found to be excellent with the Lynette 5 CNN. I built a face detector that was robust against a variety of variations in pose, lighting, uh, scale, occlusion, and accessories. Uh, it can reliably find faces with a low false positive rate. Uh, it can estimate pose reliably enough for the overlap removal algorithm. And it can implement said overlap removal algorithm to improve performance with no additional uh, training necessary. This is uh, an example of some of the face recognition forms. As I said, it can recognize very well when the features are correctly registered, but when there is incorrect registration, so for example here, it detected my mouth as uh, my right eye as well. So <laughs> an improper scaling value is passed and side eye was dated. <laughs> <laughs> and because there were relatively few individuals in the data, I uh, decided this advertisement behind me contained me because it had dark glasses. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, if I were to combine uh, aspects of the CNN's role estimator with the feature detector, I could discard uh, some of these improper feature registrations and uh, recognize when I should uh, discard recognitions as probably incorrect. So to conclude, I implemented a fully integrated near real time facial detection and recognition system. Uh, I implemented it on a lightweight, powerful, and uh, wearable computing system. I built a high performance scatter software package that uh, contains the full uh, software package and both performs facial detection and recognition and can update this data onto a real time augmented reality view. Uh, I implemented the CNN. Uh, the Lynette 5 CNN for fast, robust facial detection, including a training set that was built and tuned to be as accurate as possible. And I built an extensible object recognition system. Because of the CNN, uh, which is 
somewhat overkill for face detection. I can identify any other class of object simply by adding it to the training set with uh, actually no additional overhead in processing. So I could add a seventh alpha class corresponding to chairs, and the system would recognize chairs at the same speeds and faces that it already recognizes just faces. As far as future work, uh, in software optimizations, I'd like to uh, speed up the C5 layer of the CNN, which as you saw took 70% of the total processing time. Uh, I'd like to complete the augmented reality interface to provide more data to the user until something like this. I have time to make the other information necessary here, uh, battery and connectivity information on the top. And as far as the hardware goes, uh, more powerful computation hardware would allow a system to process frames faster and more socially acceptable displays than walking around with a heads up display would be helpful. Uh, there's a promising technology called retinal scanning displays which would sit, for example, on the edge of your eyeglasses and use very low power uh, multicolor lasers to directly draw an image onto the user's retina. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you for coming and I welcome any questions or comments. was that it had poor floating point performance. Um, would converting to fixed point operations be a possible optimization? You'd expect so, and I tried that. I implemented a system using 32-bit uh, uh, fixed point, and I found that it's not effective, mostly in part, uh, mostly because the Intel Performance Primitive Library doesn't contain uh, optimized composition routines for fixed point, so I had to uh, fall back on manually written convolutional routines, which were much slower than the, uh, even the floating point Intel performance creators convolution. So, yes, ah, question? Who's back? No, who's back? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
my photographs from the internet, et cetera, manually annotated those with correct face centers and uh, rotation and tested it against those uh, on each iteration of different uh, parameter values to see which achieved both the highest detection rate and the lowest false positive rate. Okay. Oh, so you never the testing and the, the training were never, they were always separate? Yeah. Completely. Yeah. Okay. Real. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, pick a number, I guess, between zero and eleven. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, okay, yeah. So the sigmoids, did you use sigmoids in between the, uh, well, after the subsampling layer? Yeah. You did? Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, did you consider uh, actually doing the, um, well, even the convolutional network, just to speed things up by taking advantage of the cache? Because, I mean, I don't know how you implemented it, but uh, since you have so many feet, um, well, feature maps, right. uh, you get a lot of uh, data in the cache. Right. I, the tried to, I tried to group together uh, convolutions that were using like, the same kernel devices right. to take advantage of caching, but uh, I'm not sure what kind of crazy stuff the Intel performance primitive libraries do, so they could have easily snapped the cache. No, I mean, did you, uh, by any chance, like, um, remap the image so it's more cache for a long time? Ah, um, there, let's see, at the F6 layer, uh, there was something where, because there's the 120 images, uh, originally they were stacked on top of each other, I interleaved them, which, uh, increased performance pretty substantially, but that was really the only place I could try to take advantage of. 